Good morning, everyone. This is sort of, uh, it's been a little bit since we actually had a sermon here. Uh, so this is kind of kind of different. It's been a couple of weeks. We had the baptism, which is, it, it's a sermon, but it's not as, uh, as structured as this. So uh, welcome again to the visitors and welcome for everyone that's here. Uh, we are starting a new series. And you know what? It just doesn't get any simpler than this. And, and I thought, well, when we, when we came up with these series, I have to tell you how it, how it happened. Uh, how many cannot speak Dutch here or understand Dutch? How many cannot? Ah, all right. So you're going to need an interpreter. So my uncle passed away last winter, and I went to the, uh, the funeral service. And, and I actually, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Eli probably, I think, preached while I went to that service. And there was an Amish guy, a good friend of mine, who was preaching, and in his message, he said something, and I grabbed my phone, and I made a note of it. He said it like this, when the host saw it, heard us, man. Ah. How many can it, now that you know Dutch, what did I say? Oh, well, let's slow down. Let's all do it together. If God said it, he meant it. And I'm like, wow. How often do we really sit down and think about that. If God said it, did he mean it? Now, as we look through Scripture, and I'm like, that's going to make a great series. So that's what this series is. It's going to take us in through the fall. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If God said it, he meant it. So we're just shortening it down. Did he mean it? Because the very first thing that we want to look at is what he didn't say. It's actually what he saw. Follow me close. He didn't say it. He saw it. And so we want to talk about that this morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn it to Genesis chapter 1. If you can't find Genesis chapter 1, go to Kids Church and look over there. They'll teach you where that's at. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, very first verse. We're going to read the whole thing. Uh, we don't do that very often, and, and I think there's a lot in that scripture. And, we, we, you know, we have... We're taught from young up that God created everything, and we're thankful for our parents to teach us that, and then we kind of forget about it. After we are out of kids' church or after we are out of uh, the, the kids' programs, we kind of don't hear about it as much anymore. So Genesis chapter 1, I am reading out of the NIV, uh, so I hope you can follow along with whatever translation that you have. And we're going to read the whole chapter. Is that cool? I don't have it overhead, so get your device, whatever you got to do to get it uh, on, on in front of you because I believe it's important that we see. Because in this scripture, in this passage, God saw something, and he saw it five times. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. <clears throat> and there was evening, and there was morning, and the first day. And God said, verse 6, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. From water. So God made the vault, separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters, and, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation. Seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 13, and it was evening, and there, there was evening, and there was morning, and the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them serve as signs to make sacred to mark sacred times and days and years, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. 
How many believe that? Amen. So verse 17, God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was morning, or there was evening, and there was morning, and that was the fourth day. Verse 20, God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 22, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. How many had walleye dinner? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. This summer, right? Yeah. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning. It was the fifth day. And verse 24, God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. The livestock, the creatures, the white-tailed deer, the wild turkeys. All right, that's my version of it. That move along the ground and the wild animals according to each kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kinds, livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was. Y'all can help me out. God saw that it was. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Very last verse, 31. God saw saw all that he had made, and it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning in the sixth day. <clears throat> As I was thinking about this message, I had to start thinking about creation and some of the wonderful, wonderful things that we have at our fingertips. And if you just look out into nature and last night we were at an outdoor wedding donnie got married and we were invited and so we went it was just a beautiful setting all the trees and i had to think i mean the national geographic chose holmes county as one of the top 10 viewing spots of fall leaf foliage in the world why because it's beautiful and God made it and he made it that way. It's going to be a beautiful fall. I believe with all the weather that we had, the, the, the rain that we had, I believe the leaves are going to be even more beautiful this year. And it's all the handy work of God. And as we study for this, as I study for this message, I had to think, if, it's, if it is good, did God mean it that way? What did he mean by when he said it is good? What is so good? about it what's so good about this creation and i think sometimes we skim over the top and we don't really dig in to what it really means to enjoy his creation or to view his creation so my goal here today is to magnify god it is to express in a way that you would see god in a bigger way in a better way than what you did before you got here this is not some of this material is not original with me it was brought to my attention through my son and, and I'll, I'll, give it, I'll, I'll give you that in a minute. So Psalms chapter 19, verse 1. Damon, if you could put that up there. Damon's going to have a little hard time following me today because I've got pictures and I've got all kinds of stuff going on. So, so uh, forgive him. He's only got one hand. So wave that good one, bud. Oh, by the way, no, wave your bad one. There you go. He had surgery. Praise God. Everything went good. It looks like he's going to heal all right. Yeah. And so uh, they were thinking they're going to have to do bone grafting off of his hip. 
Praise God, we didn't have to do that. So surgery went better than expected. Praise God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, it says this, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Damon, if you could put that net first picture up there of this right here is the Whirlpool Galaxy. And, and I, I got this, Louis Giglio does this, uh, uh, some of these analogies. And this is the Whirlpool Galaxy. And it is out in outer space. It's not our galaxy, but it is 31 million light years away. Now, how many have heard that term before, light years away? And sometimes it seems like it takes light years for your spouse to show up, doesn't it, when you're waiting at the grocery store or outside, right? Sometimes it, it seems like light years. Do you actually know what a light year was or is? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, he said, he said, let there be light. And there was what? Light. From his mouth it came. And if you study, if you think about it, he said, let there be light. That light traveled out of his mouth at 186,000 miles per second. Now, you're going to get your calculator out, and I promise you by the time I get done, it's not big enough. So just put it away. There's no ruler, there's no tape measure, there's no calculator that can calculate this stuff. you got to believe what I say. I, I Googled this stuff, so I, I, I'm going by that. Oh, thanks. Right. All right. So that's how fast light travels today. We know that, 186,000 miles per second. That's a, so how far is a light year? 186,000 miles per second travels in a year 5.88 trillion miles. That's trillion miles. That's a light year, 5.88. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. So you want to go to the Whirlpool Galaxy, be my guest. You can do that, but you're going to have to figure out how long it's going to take. You're only going to live between 70 and 100 years old, somewhere in there on the average. Am I right? So you should have started long before you were born because if you take 31 million and you take it times 5.8 trillion miles, that's the distance you have to cover in order to get there. Or you can figure it this way. If you could actually drive something that goes 186,000 miles per second, you would only have to drive for 31 million years to get there. You guys following me? Secondly, this galaxy right here you might want to dim the lights so they can see it better. This, this galaxy right here contains over 300 billion stars. That galaxy alone, that's just one. There's billions of galaxies out there that he spoke into be. It's only one of the hundreds of billions out there by the universe that God made. This is just a reminder of how enormous and how huge our God is, and I'm not done yet. He's bigger than any of your wildest imaginations. Anything that you could ever dreamed of, he's bigger than that. Hubble Space Telescope is floating around out in space. It's about 360 miles above the Earth, and it orbits the Earth. And it takes some pretty cool pictures. It takes some awesome images. And in the middle of that galaxy right there, they have now discovered that there's a black hole Damon, will you show us the next picture? In that black hole, that's what it looks like. Isn't that amazing? What does that remind you? The cross, right. Could it be? Could it be that he knew we would have a telescope that would bring it into our view like that that we could see? That the cross still stands in outer space? Isn't that awesome? Maybe the heavens do declare the glory of God. I'm going to try to show you in the next couple of analogies how big our God really is. How big is he actually, do you think? We'll start by looking at the sun. Damon, if you could put the sun up. Now, that's the sun as we know it. We're glad that it's shining today. We have daylight. It, it, it doesn't look too bad out the, right there, but it is more fierce than what we think. It's actually 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. How many came for a science project this morning? Amen. It's actually 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. 
But that's not what really, I mean, that's not really what amazes me. It's actually the vastness, the, the size of it that gets me. That sun is, does anybody know how far away from the earth that it really is? I'll help you out. It's 93 million miles away from the earth. 93 million miles. So at 186,000 miles per second, it takes eight minutes for that light to reach you here in Ohio when you go outside. Not bad, right? Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, it says this. Think about this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He didn't lift one finger to do this. He spoke it. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. This past week, years ago, when Damon was a kid, I bought this little golf set. And I was going to be hard-nosed and teach him how to play golf like Tiger Woods. And that didn't work. And so we put, <laughs> he's like, I think he kind of likes it again, but he's, he's screwed. He can't, can't golf with one arm. Anyway, we had these, uh, this little golf bag down in the basement, forgot about it, really, honestly, and <laughs> the other day, Becky snaps me this video of Mason in the yard, had the very same golf bag, and he was whacking these balls, and he would like, he would, he would sit there and like miss 10 times, but when he did get a hold of it, it went way down into the woods from our back, from right up the, and I'm like, wow, this little boy can hit, you know, I was like, maybe he's the next Tiger Woods, we'll see. But it reminded me of an analogy that I had heard one time. And I want all of you, this is a golf ball, you agree? I want all of you, go back to that picture, Damon, don't take that picture, Damon. The picture of the sun. I want all of you to think about it this way. Imagine yourself on this golf ball, this golf ball is the earth. This golf ball is the earth. Now I'm about to show you. If I could, and I didn't, but the sun is 15 if, if this golf ball is the earth, then the sun is 15 feet in diameter. Does that make sense? And if I could put that up there, that's not quite 15 feet. But if I could hold this up here just to give you a perspective of where you're at in the grand scheme of things. You're on the golf ball. That's the sun. Okay? You guys following me? So... If the, if the earth would be, or the earth is a golf ball, the sun is 15 feet in diameter, let me give you a couple of perspectives of what that looks like. You could take 960,000 of these golf balls and put them inside of that 15 foot sphere. 960,000, not quite a million. That's enough golf balls to fill a school bus that you could put in a 15 foot round circle. That's how big the sun is. <coughs> We see it every day. <coughs> Excuse me. Didn't have a choice. We worship a star-breathing God. Think about that. The second star that I want to talk about, Damon, if you'll put it up there. This one here is called Betelgeuse. It's not quite as clear, but it's a lot farther away. He's only 427 light years away. So you take 427 light years times 5.88 trillion miles, that's how far he is away. He's twice the size, not of the sun, of the earth's orbit around the sun. Twice the size of the earth's orbit around the sun. So if the earth were a golf ball, Betelgeuse, however you want to say it, you can go Betelgeuse if you want to, that's how Louis Giglio says it would be the height of six empire state buildings on top of each other. So you could go to New York City, you could set that down, and it would be, and you get across the street and you look at it, it would be six empire state buildings tall. That's how big this star is, and that's how little the earth is. And you're on that somewhere, still. It's amazing. The God that made this, we, we pray to him and we tell him our plans and we tell him how to do things and we, we challenge him on things and we, we make him, I don't know, he probably doesn't take it personal, but we ask him to do things for us and he's in control. He said it is good. 
this is just good. Six Empire State buildings tall. Good compared to the earth. It's just good. The third star we want to talk about is Musifi. He's 3,000 light years away. If the earth were a golf ball, and you went out to San Francisco, and you put it at one end of the Golden Gate Bridge, and stood back and looked at it, it would be two widths of the Golden Gate Bridge larger than the earth. You could fit 2.7 quadrillion Earths inside of this one star. That's not the biggest one. Lately, they found a bigger one. It's a bigger star than that. Amen, if you'll put it up there. This one's name is Canis Majoris. The big dog, I guess. Golf ball? Yeah. You get the point now, don't you? It's the last one, by the way. But you get the point. If, you, if the earth were a golf ball and you took it to Canis Majoris, that particular star would be the size and the height of Mount Everest to the earth. And it shines every day. And we can see it. It would take seven quadrillion Earths to fill the Canis Majoris. That's enough Earths to cover the entire state of Texas, 22 inches deep with golf balls. And somewhere in there, you are. Mike, happy golfing. I don't know about you, but some, that gives me like this sense of shrinking feeling I get when I think about that. It's not a bad one. It's actually a good one because I think if, if God is that big and we never really stop and think of the expanse of the, and the vastness of space and of what's going on out there, what he created out there because we're, we're just focused here. We, we enjoy the grass. We enjoy the plants. We enjoy the food that he gave us. We enjoy everything around us that we see and can feel. But the things that, he, that we can't see necessarily, or we can, but we don't choose to, he takes care of them and he calls that good. Then what's he going to do with us? How does he feel about us? And when, when he says that the heavens declare his glory, I believe that. Do you? Amen. We're so small and we're so fragile. And yet, I know that he cares for us because he said in creation, the very first chapter, that it is good. He saw it as good. He didn't say it. He saw it as good. Did he really mean it? As big and as awesome as those facts are, there's something that impresses me even more. When you study creation and why it's good, the thought that we are, though but a vapor, we're here today, we're going tomorrow, you hear that say, we have been marked by his majesty. Remember the black hole with the cross in it? I'm about to show you something. Because the Bible says that we've been created in the very image of God who breathes out stars and universes and puts them in place. You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, it, it, it alarms me as some of the educational programs that are out there teaching against this, that we were evolved from something like a, some ape when we know that God Created. You're a miracle. I'm a miracle. The way you were formed. The DNA in your body. They said that each cell inside of your body has a DNA lineage in it, a code in it. And if you were to take that code out, it would go about six feet in code. And if you could read that code, 
then it would take almost 96 years because your body has 75 trillion cells in it. It would take almost, if you could lay it out in legible data, it would take almost 96 years to read just you, just me, of who God formed us to be. And we have people that doubt this stuff. It all started from one cell in your mom and one cell in your dad. And we won't go further than that. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Those two cells meet. There's 23 chromosomes in each of those that create one cell and then it starts. And on the third day of conception, Damon, will you put the next picture up? Does anybody know what that is? The little dots up here? That's on the third day of conception. That's 16 little cells that are going to make you and me. It's on the edge of a very magnified safety pin. An extremely magnified safety pin. That is how big you are at three days. And then it goes from there. And at about five months, your vision, the, the, the baby forms, the vision is there. And then at six months, actually, something comes in and cuts little lids you have one piece over your eyes for a long time and then at the six month it comes in and cuts and, and and we're fearfully and wonderfully made it's amazing what that what our bodies are 75 trillion little cells like that that make our body and the god of the heavens and that that's magnified on a safety pin i want you to know that like look at a safety pin that's how small you start and that's how big Canis Majoris, that's how big that star is, and you start that small, could God actually call it good? <clears throat> he knows your name. He knows my name. He knows every problem that we're going through, and yet we start so small. But I do know this in my life. What I've found is if I trust him, I literally can feel his presence in my life. And he, the promise in the Bible says that he will hold you. The God of the vast universe who said it is good, he will hold you in his hand until the end of time of your days. Psalm chapter 33 keeps talking about the star-breathing God. In verse 9, it says this, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. How many believe that? He's watching you today. He's watching this today. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. Not some. And sometimes yet it does feel like the things that we go through, that he's not there. I know, I go through those things myself. There's hard times here on earth, and sometimes we feel like there's no way that God could be present. If he was, he'd do something about it, right? But he's watching from his dwelling place. He watches all who live on earth, and he, form, he who forms the hearts of all, he considers everything they do. Verse 18, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his unfailing love to deliver them from death. And keep them alive in famine. This is a promise. He's saying, I'm a universe maker. And it is good. Do you believe what he meant? And he said, it is good. It is very good. He's saying, I'm a heart former. He says it right there. And it's good. He says, I also am intimate enough, even though I have the vasts of heaven that I created, I'm intimate enough to know your circumstances and everything that you're going through, you and I both. And he says, I promise you, I will hold you together and deliver you from death and from famine. It's a promise of God. And you guys know how I am about promises. If he says it, he meant it. That's what this whole series is going to be about. And then you say, well, you know what? 
You can say that, Jimmy, because of some of the miracles that you've seen in your life and around you. But what about me? What about you? God's holding you together. God's holding your life together. God's holding you together. So let's look a little bit deeper into our own physical body. In our body, there is a human. It's a, yeah. Wow. All right. Good job. There is a cell adhesion molecule. A cell adhesion molecule. Now, you know what adhesive means? It means stick together. So there is a molecule out there, and it's called laminin. Okay? Now, laminin is what holds our bodies together. So it's the same way as you concrete guys. If you put concrete down, the first thing you do is you put rebar in, right, to reinforce it. So if you can look at it this way, your physical body, our human bodies have a glue, so to speak, or we have rebar in our bodies. It holds our skin on. It holds our organs together. It holds some of us that don't hold the hair on, but that's okay. It holds us together. And it's called laminin. And here's a scientific diagram of what laminin looks like in your body. Nope, the other one, Damon. That one. That's what doctors have claimed to be inside of your DNA. The 75 trillion cells that are in your body, the laminin is part that keeps it all together. If we didn't have laminin in our bodies, we'd be melted across the floor. That's what holds us together. Doesn't that remind you of something that if we've seen before? Now, if you look at the actual uh, the picture, you can go to the next one, Damon. That's actually what that cell looks like. It's an adhesion cell that holds everything together. And it's the perfect shape of a cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you look into outer space, into the black hole of the farthest galaxy that we can find, you will see inside of that black hole, you will see something that resembles the cross of Jesus Christ. If you look into the smallest cell known to man that is inside of your body that holds you together, there is a sign of the Lord Jesus Christ's cross that holds you together. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, and Paul says it like this, For him, for in him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I think Paul understood the laminin theory. I thought it to be pretty clever and cool. How God did that. Brandon, if you want to bring your team up. In this world that we live in, I mean, I know Becky and I have been faced with some things and just in business and in, in, for her physical healing. By the way, she's scheduled to go in. When is it? Last of September. Every morning at 8 o'clock, we have this cute little beep that goes off. We didn't know what it was at first. We actually went and started putting toys in the basement from Mason's room because Mason was like, not in the basement, but downstairs. We, he kept telling me, Dad, I hear this beeping noise in the morning. It's waking me up. And this was coming into school. And, and then once school started, of course, we're up. And, and, and I'm like, well, what is it? And, and he doesn't know. And... and uh, Becky was like, well, she's been trying different things. And finally, we were like, well, it must be the fire alarm, the smoke alarm. It's time to change those batteries probably. But we have a cathedral ceiling in our bedroom. And so to get a ladder in there is just like, uh, anyway, if somebody want to volunteer? Cool. Come on over. You can do it. Anyway, we were like, well, that must be. I told her. I, I said, you know, it's been nine years. That's probably a dead battery. And uh, so we were getting ready to, to do that. And the other morning, she calls me. She goes, Jimmy. You will not believe. I said, why? She goes, I'm sitting here at Mark Weaver's getting my oil changed, and I'm in the waiting room, and this alarm went off. I'm like, really? She goes, yeah. And I said, well, what is it? She said, well, I was looking through my purse. I looked at my phone. It was her defibrillator. Battery's dying. Praise God for technology, right? So I called in. I mean, Becky called in. We asked if we could just get rid of it. They didn't think that was a good idea. 
But we know, we know who the healer is, and we know that her heart, we feel, is perfect. But uh, that's coming up, so if you guys could keep her in your prayers. I, it's not a major deal. It's an outpatient deal, but it's still just, I told her she could go to Herb's Tarp and get a zipper installed, and then it would be a lot easier. <laughs> we have fun at home. But in this world, we know that things can go wrong. The pressure is on sometimes. And sometimes, I mean, we're coming out of a, a very lean summer at the store. It was, the sales weren't good. Traffic wasn't great. And so we understand what it means. And God holds us in his hands, and he keeps us together. And it's through his, the majesty, it's through the grace, and it's through the cross. And he says it is good. And when he was done with it all, he said it is very good. Now I know why. Because he's got his stamp in every single piece of the earth that he created. And that includes you and includes me. He holds us together through his love on the cross. Isaiah understood it in chapter 40, verse 28. He said it like this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. That's for you and for me. And looking at the contrast between this infinitely large God who created this infinitely large universe and the intimacy that he has inside of me and you. Where's the golf ball, Mike? Hold it up. Me and you are on that. <laughs> Did God mean it when he saw that it was good? How many believe? He created you. He loves you. And he will take care of you.